So I'll be moderating the panel and I wanted to introduce Creativity in case you're not aware of um, what the company does. So Creativity was founded 22 years ago with the intention of, of developing electronic products and that has evolved over time to include products that, that touch digital across many different types of uh, channels. And so over the lifetime of the company, they've helped to, to develop and to launch over 7,000 products. And that's anything from smart toys to mobile apps and voice experiences for Amazon Alexa and Google Assistant. I hope I don't set yours off. Um, so we uh, Creativity partners with all of the world's global toy companies, many brands first, they're certified agency for both Amazon and Google directly. So work with a number of different companies um, just to provide that kid focused expertise and create amazing experiences for families. And we have a couple of, um, like I said, a couple of representatives and leaders from the group on the, on the call. And it's because of them that we're able to all meet here. So thank you so much um, to Charlie, Josh, and Liana for your continued efforts to sustain this group and, and carry it forward. So I'd love to turn this over to Mary and um, start to, to tackle this program and, the, and this concept so that we can learn what it's like to, um, to, to run these play tests in remote areas. Um, Mary has a ton of experience working um, in consulting in, in the youth and family space over 20 years, um, working with different companies to have strategies to build amazing, amazing products and experiences. So um, turning it over to Mary, I'd love to also give you the screen so you can share your wisdom and inspire us. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for the introduction. Uh, let's see. I will look for your screen to go away and then I will share mine. Ooh, and let me just make sure that I share yeah. the audio with that. Perfect. And just so everyone knows, we are going to record this. Um, so be mindful if that is a sensitive <laughs> moment for you. Okay. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, very good, thank you. So what we're talking about today is how we all did a lot of play testing in person and how we had to shove that into the online space during the pandemic um, and what that's gonna mean really for us even later. Okay, um, so just for anybody that doesn't know about CNR, we are a, a custom market research uh, insights agency based in Chicago. The company has been around for 60 years. I've only been here for 18, so I'm kind of a, a, a junior one. Uh, but we're it's mostly custom qual and quant that we do here. We've got a couple dozen moderators and about twice that in terms of quantitative analysts. Everything that we do is based here in the U.S. Um, the, our bread and butter is customer research and UX, that kind of thing. Uh, we do a little B and B on the side, and then we have these niche areas. So we we have expertise in generation, uh, Latinos, multicultural, uh, our culture beat uh, group, youth and family, which is the one that I lead, and then also shoppers. Uh, and then just so that you're aware of what we do, the um, most of what we do is custom, but we do have some syndicated offerings. So we have Youth Beat and Youth Beat Junior. So Youth Beat is kids, tweens, and teens. We're in field every single month with them on a very kind of holistic survey about the rhythms of their lives and the media and play and all that as well. Uh, we're in field quarterly with the parents. And then we have Youth Beat Junior. So that's our survey of parents of preschoolers. And all of this is fueled by our panels. So we are fully COPE compliant with Kids Eyes. And then when kids graduate uh, from Kids Eyes, they go into Teens Eyes. And then we have a Parent Speak community. What we're talking about today is one of our custom youth research approaches. And then we also do all kinds of consulting. So clients call us in and they say, hey, what do you know about millennials? And we say, let us tell you what we know about millennials. Um, the agenda for what I'm going to go through today, and this is going to move really quick. So I encourage everyone to put comments in the chat. 
Uh, and then we can answer questions towards the end. So what we're going to talk about today is that kind of initial scramble when we couldn't talk to kids in person anymore, what did we do? Then what are the really the benefits, kind of the silver linings that we learned about doing research with kids online? Then potholes for things that you could avoid. Um, also, what do we expect from coming back to research in person? Then just a couple of tips about practical advice for if you want to try this at home, what it could look like. And then finally, a few takeaways for you and your uh, investors and clients. So first, let's talk about, wait, what happened? Because we used to do at CNR all kinds of in-person kid research. And it was March 11th, 2020, when the global pandemic was declared and we had all kinds of things going on that had to get moved. So we were doing lots of focus groups and play labs in person, and these would be one-offs. So we'd be in person with folks. Um, you know, and then the way we would recruit with these is we deliberately didn't want to get kids who knew each other. We wanted kids from separate school districts. But now you've got COVID and you can't mix kids from separate school districts. Uh, so that, that wasn't appropriate anymore. Um, and so when, when the schools closed, we said, no way, we're not, you know, we're not going to invite you to come in person anymore. Uh, instead, we're going to move things online. Um, and then we also had these ongoing in-person panels. So we've, we've got clients that, you know, we've got kids recruited. Their parents have said, you know what, we'd like to sign up for the whole year. Uh, but you get three months down the road and, and we couldn't do that anymore. And the respondents were kind of willing to come in, but we wanted to have a lot of caution and to make sure that we're not mixing kids and not mixing germs. Um, so we sort of moved all of that online as well. The nice thing about uh, CNR and what, what really helped us is that we already had an asynchronous online team. Um, so, you know, we've, it's been a, a decade that we've had online qualitative and online communities, as well as shorter term uh, one-offs. Uh, so we were able to tap into all those practices and help us move all this play testing to an online space. So uh, for an example, the, the way that we might used to have done this research is maybe a four grouper. Um, so we do parent child tandem groups. And I love these. So the kid comes in first and they play with everything and you see what they do. And they've got a sticky name tag on them. And then you have them take off the name tag, stick it on the table ahead of them and it, they they really like to slam it. That's fun for them, um, and, you know. And then they leave, and then their parents come in, and so we have a babysitter and a video uh, ready for them to watch. And then the parents come in, and they talk about the same kind of stimulus, but we hear it from the parent perspective, and that's really easy to tease out, um, you know what the parents love and what the children love and would you really buy this for your kid if they really wanted it. Um, and so these are pretty decently sized groups. We'd recruit eight, seat six per group. Um, and then the parents would be uh, different, uh, you know, a different interview from what the kid has. And so instead, what we had to morph for was instead of parent-child groups, we had parent-child segments. So we have, you know, the, the same sort of older, younger boys, girls at the same time. But instead of recruiting eight to see six per group, so you've got 24 size sample. Um, for the online, we're recruiting like 10 families for about eight to show. So a, a pretty smaller sample size. And then 
when you're in somebody's home with them on camera, you really can't do parents and kids separately. They had to be done together. So here's what we had to do. We had to change our preparation. So what we used to do, oh my gosh, weren't these the wonderful days when you could just call up a facility and throw them some money, um, you know, and they they'd arrange all the people to come in um, and all the logistics of all of that. Um, but what became really important with the switch to online is first of all, availability. So we have a couple of platforms that we work with. Um, Civicom is fantastic, Recollective, we work with a lot, um, but those facilities were just getting overrun. They were understaffed for you know, the, this boom that, that needed to come their way. Uh, so just thinking about, are they available? And at the same time, what platform are you gonna choose so that your clients can observe it? And, you know, if you've got 10 people and they might be all around the world, um, you know, what, what platform is gonna uh, accommodate them in the best way? And some of those are going to be really expensive, like the, the best ones with the most tech checks. And they, you know, they get a tech person uh, with you, the, the full time of the play lab. Those are going to be really expensive. So that's important for the client teams to know. Um, and then, you know, just thinking about that, that need for tech support or lack thereof. And so the kinds of things that instead of, booking a facility, we had to think about, uh, you know, what we used to do incorporating into the guide were things like turn taking. So I'm going to say my, I, I'm going to write my answer down and then I'm going to show it, um, you know, but everybody has to write it out at the same time so that we don't have that, that thought leadership, um, you know, and that's the same kind of thing as secret voting. Like you, you know, you vote, uh, here, I've got a, a meter. This is one of the examples of the meters that we use. And you, you know, you vote on the meter, you put it in your lap, set your vote, and then everybody shows it at the same time. So that kind of thing is a little harder to do online. Um, and other things like kinesthetics. So we would always, you know, in in-person groups have break times and make yourself as tall as you can be and then as small as you can be. And you know all those kinesthetics really uh, incorporate into uh, what are their responses to the stimulus that we're showing them. So we really couldn't do that. Um, so we had to rethink that kind of thing. Uh, in particular, the uh, things that uh, we used to do is that we would pack up the room decorations. So I've got uh, a couple of examples here uh, of like meters that we would use, thumb scales. Uh, you know, we've got all these decorations. Like you set up the room like a teacher. That's what you do when you, when you can go in person. And I'm, I'm kind of well known for putting up fish in, in, uh, streaming kind of situation so that it looks like an aquarium. Uh, we've got our physical meters, our scales, um, you know, lots of worksheets and good smelly markers and tangible stimuli. So, you know, things like, oh, this is, this is, you know, what is that? It's a pineapple. And, you know, what does that mean to you? Or whatever else is the stimulus that is relevant to the project. And so what we had to do is we had to send that all to their homes. Uh, and what that meant in 2020 was you had to allow a couple of extra days because the United States Post Office was running on a delay. So we would generally add a whole week to the timeline for our projects uh, just because they were so delayed. Uh, it's also important to include bonuses. I'll show you a couple of those with our kids here. Um, and then also we had to digitize the stimuli. So instead of having something 3D in person, we had to have something on screen for the moderator that we could share. 
these are a few examples of what this can look like. So um, I, I want to I be fully transparent here that um, we created a study for you, uh, specifically for, you know, for this presentation uh, that, because I can't share my client's information because that would be a violation of NDAs. So what we're showing here is something that is, you know, completely free to share. Um, and so what we did is reminiscent of what we have done for our clients in the past year. So um, some of the things that, you know, that we've, we've done over mail is something that we would have loved to have done in person. So ordering things. So we've got our number one, our number two, our number three envelopes. Kids open up different things and there's different things in each one. Um, we've got, you know, our emoji scale down below. We also, you know, we can also share screens. So if, you know, if a child is shopping online or if they're doing, um, you know, playing a video game or some, some sort of UX experience online, we can actually have them share that big back with us so that we can see what they're enjoying or not about each one. And now I'm going to show you some videos. So uh, again, or just a reminder that we set this up for you personally. Um, these are actually children that I have met before. I know their mothers, um, but it's been a good year and a half. So you're going to see me go all full tilt uh, Aunt Mary on them a couple of times. So not really the most objective moderator that you would want to have. Um, but uh, we got some really amazing responses from these kids. So let's hear what they had to say. Do you remember you pulled out that worksheet that had the emoji faces on it? Yeah. And you had a pen too. I want you to look at those emojis and I want you to circle the one that shows me how do you feel about this book? So which, how do you feel about it? Do you like it? And then you're going to circle which one. So this is happy and sad. So circle the ones that you want that you. And it's okay if you say, Miss Mary, I hate this book. Or you could say, I love it. Or you could say anything in between. Whatever is really true for Niall. Uh, which one do you like? Oh. You I like it. You like it? Show me. Oh, you put two hearts. Remember when you pulled that worksheet out that had all the faces on it? Mm -hmm. I want you to use. Was there a was there a marker inside your envelope that you can show me? It's your marker. Let's see if there's a marker in your envelope. Yay! I found one. You found one. Good job. I found a marker. <laughs> Can you use your marker to show me? Just circle which one of those faces fits with the way you feel about this book. Uh, where? Okay. And you can tell me the truth if you want to say, "Oh, Mary, I don't like this at all." That's okay. You don't make me feel good or bad by anything you say. I want to know the truth. This one. She wrote, oh, you picked a smile face. You did. Can you tell me why that means the one that you think about this book? Yeah. yeah. Can you lift up and show her? Okay. Good job. Do you remember you pulled out that? So the other nice thing about these uh, in-person interviews is that you can get a lot of good observations. So as long as you can see them on the camera. So what I'm interested in, in this first clip here is how able is she to open the, the package? And then for him, I'm going to force him to make a choice later between things he likes a lot. 
Napkins? Why do we napkins? I don't know. Why would you need napkins? Wow, we got toys. Shaka. I think that's everything. I wonder which one do you want to open first? Have you seen that before? Okay, what is this? Have you seen this before? Have you have you eaten that? No. No. What? What? Any idea? What is it? What is that, Anya? I'm gonna eat this later because I'm not hungry. No, let's eat a little bit though. <laughs> That's okay. Can we just taste it? No, not yet. Oh, you okay. Want it's all right if you don't want to taste it quite yet. What? I want to know, is that more fun or less fun than the book? It's fun. Do you like, but do you like this one more or that one more? Do you like this one or that one more? This one more. You like this one more. <laughs> you like this one more. Good job. Can uh, you sh can you show me on your worksheet what you think about the toy? Can you circle one of those? Pick up your pen again. And remember, so which one of these for this one? Uh, so this is like it. Yeah, and this means you don't like it. And then you could do in between. And what is yeah. it? That's, that's that you kind of like it. And what's this? And it's eh, not really. Uh, and this one's like I don't like it at all. Um, Tell me the truth, Niall. <laughs> <laughs> Can you show? <laughs> me I like it. You like it too. It's the same. Okay. So, uh, yeah, he's so adorable, but needed me to force him into a choice of which of those two did you really like better. So here are some uh, of the advantages of doing in-person uh, or rather online interviews with kids. Um, first of all, they're in their natural turf. Uh, so they're comfortable. You know, you think about when you go and visit kids in home for research, sometimes they're really comfortable with like, who is this strange lady in my house and who are her three friends that she wants to bring with us? Um, but it's much more comfortable to visit them in home uh, with their camera and they've all been e-learning for a year. So they're all pretty comfortable with doing something that is like a, a Zoom session. Um, another thing is that getting that snail mail, even if it's just a number one on the back of an envelope, uh, you know, with something small inside, it's very exciting for them and gets them interested in participating and really kind of elevates their senses. And they don't, you know, slump under the table, uh, you know, when you're trying to interview them. Then you got bonus siblings. So a lot of times, I, I don't have examples of it here, but a lot of times there's other kids running around the house that might be in your age target, but they might not have been the one that you recruited. Um, so they might provide feedback as well. Uh, we've also got parental scaffolding. So you've seen both of these moms kind of help their kids understand, like, what are the answer options here? And how am I allowed to communicate back? Um, also, spontaneous stimuli. So if I ask, what's your favorite toy? And, you know, you run off and grab the pineapple, you know, that that might take 90 seconds, but it's really worth well worth the time uh, for something that you just can't explore in person as well. And then finally, you've got the ability to follow up later. So we we did some toy testing this fall because, you know, Christmas shopping was just way out the window. Uh, but we do have uh, an example of something where a mother was able to follow up with video after our interview. And let's see what she had to say. This is Anya. What happened? I hate all of it. <laughs> I don't know what it is. 
What's going on over here? What, what is this? It broke. <laughs> <laughs> is that why they give you so many of them? Mm-hmm. Because if one breaks, you can eat the other. Would you want Mommy to get this again? <laughs> yeah, I like the chocolate and the little things that come with it. Can you get another puppy dog thing? Another puppy dog thing like this? These yep. Are your, these were your favorite things for sure. Uh, yes. And I right. got the things Mary gave me. Yeah, Mary gave you those. She has good ideas. So you can see that um, sometimes with online research, we can do online feedback like, a, a, you know, a parent could post a blog a week later after they've played with something and we see what elements are working well for them, what's not. Uh, in this case, uh, we introduced this little girl to Kinder Joys. Uh, and now I'm afraid her parents are going to have to be finding them uh, a lot more. So uh, what are the pitfalls? There are lots of things that can go wrong. Most of this, I'm just going to put this all up because most of this is what we hate about Zoom already. Like you're already sick of the lighting and the background noise. Um, oh, lack of wardrobe. We realized early into this process that we had to instruct children in this, well, parents really in the screener that your child must wear a shirt uh, to the interview because we had a lot of children that were just like, uh, you know, Zoom, Zoom call, don't care. Um, things like technology roadblocks. So it really depends on the platform that you're using, whether they have tech support or whether you're going to step up and do that yourself and that can be really difficult um also any kind of distractions in the way like you know dad has the tv on too loud in the background and you know let's come back to the interview uh all those kinds of things are are not really different from what zoom distractions are uh but things to think about if you're going to try and do a play lab online um, the other thing that I did want to mention is the parent speaking for the child. So when I talked about earlier that often we will split parents and kids, we have kids come in first, react, go away, parents come in next, react. Um, and so children in that situation really get to speak for themselves. There are times when kids uh, you know, in these online interviews, because the parents and kids are together, you, you, you really have to kind of tell the parent, hey, shut up. Can I just hear what your kid thinks about this first? And then you can react because the, the parents will often uh, shut things down for their child. So that's just a, a moderation technique. Um, there are some other things that are important. When you think about, uh, in particular, like the camera angles, I'm just going to show one of these. Like, how do you, you have to kind of coach the folks that are participating to help them. <laughs> I'm still getting bigger. You just, so you can't see me because I'm little getting bigger. You're so big, Niall. I can't yeah, see. I look like a giant. Like a giant. <laughs> <laughs> you used to be just little and I could see all of you in the camera. Yeah, I can't see. You can't see my head. I can't see the top of your head. I can only see your mouth and maybe a little bit of your ears. Yeah. <laughs> I just, <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm going to leave that there. I think you all get it. Like these kids are adorable. I could watch the videos of them for days. Uh, but there are reasons why it will be great when we can to go back to in-person research. One of those. We just get more people in the room. Um, and so we all feel more comfortable about the results of our research when we have a little bit more of a sized uh, sample base. Um, you know, also building on each other's ideas. So the nice thing about online qualitative in an asynchronous way is that we can have 
kids and parents and whoever post things um, and then build on each other's ideas. But it, it really does seem to evolve in a more natural way when we're in person. So as a in-person moderator, I long for that. Um, you know, we get some nonverbals when we're on Zoom, but it's not the same as in person. Like you can tell a child's emotional state, like if, if they've had a hard day, you know, and they're, they're stressed and they're like slumping down under the chair, you can understand it when you're in person in a much better way than you can when you're uh, online. And then also there's those separate reactions from kids and parents. So we can do that a little bit online um, with online live interviews. It's really hard to separate the reactions. If it's something more asynchronous, then we can get kids reactions and parents reactions via text. Uh, but it's cleanest when we can do it in person and we hear what the kid thinks and then what the uh, parent thinks as well. And, you know, just in general, we have a more controlled environment. So all of the th these things that I'm mentioning that if you're, you know, gonna test the way something plays with kids and with parents, if you can bring them to a neutral position, uh, so someplace that they, they don't usually always go, then that's more of an equal playing field for them. And then, ooh, top secret stimuli. So uh, I, I always think about this in terms of, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. So I grew up on the Gene Wilder version of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And there was that Mr. Slugworth that you always had to worry about. Uh, and so nobody wanted to, uh, you know, divulge secrets to him. Um, so when you're in person, if things like taste testing or anything tangible like packaging, those things are much better controlled when you are in person. Okay, so here are my tips for how to do this if you're trying it at home. Uh, first of all, just allow extra time. The mail is still a little bit slow. You're gonna have to need technology checks for everybody and field in terms of like recruiting. All of that is a little bit slower right now because the demand is so uh, large. Uh, also guardrails in terms of introductions. So this might be something you even send in the screener, like please, wear a shirt to this conversation. Uh, a combination of variety and, rep and repetition in the guide that you write. So you want enough variety of responses. So, you know, what's, what's number one? What's number two? How do you feel on the meter? You know, um, all these other, like I have, I have gold, silver, bronze, and, you know, just a no thank you. Um, you know, all of these kinds of responses, build that in for a variety and fun. Um, but at the same time, you have to think about repetition. So younger kids in particular, they need to go through the same exercise time and time again in order to just sort of get the drill. So gold, silver, bronze, gold, silver, bronze, the next time, the same thing. Um, any kind of uh, additional platforms that you need the moderator to divulge. So uh, we've experimented a lot with uh, the, the, the two main ones, uh, Miro and then Mural. So Mural, M-U-R-A-L is the one that we've settled on at CNR that works best for us. Um, other things may work for others. Um, all those tech checks, just, you know, make sure people's Wi-Fi is working and their lighting is okay. Um, and then lastly, make sure you get an expert kid moderator so that you're working with someone that understands the way to articulate questions and particularly follow-ups. Uh, for the kids. And then nearing our end time, these are my takeaways. 
Uh, so the great thing that we've seen is that moving Play Labs online, we've seen that we can yield a lot of great, really actionable insights, you know, putting things in kids' own homes and sending them to them and talking to them with a real life moderator is pretty effective. Um, the important thing to keep in mind is the timing. So that will drag out your timing a little bit uh, with uh, extra tech checks. Just make sure you can see everybody and they have Wi-Fi so they can respond to you. Um, respondent pre-work is really uh, a great idea if you do have to move online. It's just some kind of homework. And so that could be, you know, it, lots of traditional things that we do in kids moderation, like an object is lesson. So uh, if I say, you know, what's a favorite vacation destination? I might, you know, I'll bring my pineapple back again and I'll say anything, you know, from the Caribbean, that kind of thing. Um, and it, it needs to be written out so that they can participate uh, appropriately before they come to the virtual event. Also, um, you know, think about partnering with uh, a real kid moderator. It's not so easy when you do it with just your friends' kids. Uh, somebody needs to be a trained moderator uh, in this kind of research. And then finally, the last things, um, you know, for, for these more confidential kind of prototypes, if you're dealing with a UX thing that might have some intellectual property that is really important, yeah, do think about coming back to in-person as it's slowly starting to evolve. And that is all I have to share. So thank you, Liana and Caitlin. Thank you, Mary. This was super informative and I love all the examples. I think what we've learned from our time hosting these is that everyone here loves seeing kids. So you definitely put a smile on my face and I'm sure everybody who is watching also feels the same way. Um, I'll start out with some questions, but I encourage everyone to put questions in the chat or come off mute um, when, I, when I introduce a good time to do that. Um, we want this discussion to be really collaborative and um, to even hear your thoughts. I know there's a, a number of different researchers at other companies who are here too. So my question um, is, is really around the business implications of a lot of what you've shared, because um, what we're seeing is there's just so much extra load that you are being tasked to do and the moderators are being tasked to do and the shipping and all this stuff. So the decentralization aspect of this must be adding to your costs from a physical, uh, tangible perspective as well as time. So I'm wondering how you can manage that and make sure that your budgets don't blow up. And also if that's something that you've been forced to, to absorb or, or had to find other ways to offset those costs. That is a really great question because you're you're one hundred percent right. Like you think about all the extra time it takes, and you know, like buying product and shipping product, it does add to the cost. Um, so uh, when I, I shared one of my earlier slides was about like, you know, you do like four groups or you do like twelve interviews. Um, those are going to be very similar costs or even more. So you have, when you, when you have to move online, you kind of have fewer, fewer people uh, for the same cost. A, a follow on to that, how are you able to get groups together? Is it usually siblings or, or, or like neighborhood kids? Oh, uh, no. So what, what we do is we work with local um, uh, research facilities. So there's, right. there's a ton of these folks, uh, you know, and they have databases of people that are really willing to come in. And so what, what we do is we, we kind of screen out siblings or folks who know each other um, because, so, so here, here, this is just my personal take, but uh, I hate friendship groups because I feel like that's two opinions. That's one opinion for two prices. Um, so there, you know, it really all depends on the topic. Um, but if it's not a sensitive topic, if it's just a fun topic, then I feel like it's better to get a bunch of individual kids 
and then uh, look at their responses. And I, I think I said before that I'm like kind of a less is more sample size person, but I, I think they need to be less, you know, just independent respondents rather than, you know, I don't want four kids living in the same house. They're going to, they're going to tell me the same thing. Yeah. And influence each other, put pressure, of course. Um, I'm, I'll go into the chat for one of the questions. There was a question around any tips for playtesting all a, a pure digital experience, because um, the examples that you shared were mostly had a physical element to them. Um, from what we see, I'm sure you've, you have done a number of other types of products, but any tips for getting like the real understanding of how kids are, are flowing through an app or a digital experience? Well, sure. So uh, we use uh, a couple of partners that like you really need a good um, platform partner for this. So we use lookback.io. Lookback.io um, is probably our favorite one. Um, so you can send somebody on a digital UX mission and then they can uh, respond to you back afterwards. I have a few more questions, but I'd, I'd love if if I could turn it over to the, the community and see if anyone else has anything to ask. I see Michelle, you want to come off? You're welcome to come up on camera. I can ask it for you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mary, for this presentation. That was really great. Um, so I wanted to ask, you mentioned that you used Look Back for testing digital products, but have you tried using Zoom as well? Oh, um, I personally have not, um, but I, I don't think that's a, I, I don't think that's a bad approach. I would be interested in that. Um, you know, haven't, haven't personally used it. I, I think that, you know, the, the nice thing about like a look back or user lytics is the other one that we use. Um, the nice thing about them is that they, they have more like click uh, registries. So I think that if you, if you did zoom, you just have to know this is going to be purely qual and I'm just going to kind of look at your emotions while you go through it and see what you have to say. Right. Yeah, I guess it's better for um, an unmoderated testing. Yeah. Thank you. Scott, did you want to ask a question? Um, sure, sure. I'm just curious uh, if you use any screen recording devices when testing out new apps or new software products. And, and certainly, um, you know, anything that is uh, capturing um, you know, click data or, or um, you know, I, I used to test with a product that's long since gone away where I could record facial expressions at the same time. I'm just curious if what recommendations you have from a software perspective. Yeah, that, uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, Realize is the one that we've worked with uh, with kids uh, before. And the thing is that you, you really just have to tell everybody up front what you're going to do. And if you need them to consent, uh, you know, the parents can consent. Um, children under the age of 18 cannot consent to any kind of research. They can't consent to any kind of legal document. So they have to assent uh, to, to being observed, but you really have to get those, uh, their parents' permission there. But really then after that, you can collect every click you want. I don't know if that was a good answer to your question, David. Oh, sorry, I, was that, that was directed at me. Yeah, I guess I, guess I was just curious if the, um, you know, what kinds of things you had to include or, or, or exclude when going from digital or going from online or in person to, to digital? Oh, you mean in terms of consent? Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, uh, we actually partner with an outside company, um, Privo. You've mm -hmm. probably heard of them. They're in every, every conference. Um, mm -hmm. But 
you know, essentially it's a questionnaire that, that says, um, you know, I, I consent to every medium in perpetuity throughout the universe. Um, you know, and that, that's kind of what we ask for here in the United States. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's Scott. I have another question and that, that, uh, certainly made me think, I know when we work up our release forms, whenever we do kit testing, we're also very specific about what we're keeping and what we're not keeping after the testing and after we have studied the material. Can you share any advice of what you hold on to and what you tell parents that you don't? Sure. Um, so uh, that sounds like an academic background uh, because we're, you know, in the in the academic setting, we're always very clear about we're going to destroy your evidence after, you know, an X number of time. Um, in the commercial world, we we really don't say that, and we we don't tell people that their evidence will be destroyed out of out of you know whatever period of time. Um, it's kind of do you want to do this, and we might keep it forever, or you don't want to participate. Um, you know, so that's my experience in the in the corporate world. Um, do I feel like that's ideal? No. Uh, you know, because I come from an academic background as well, but that's kind of the way things are done. Like, you, you know, you uh, click through things and click the terms of service. Of course, I agree, because I just want to buy these shoes right now. So uh, I think that's a larger issue than this, this <laughs> uh, presentation might uh, honor. I was wondering how you write the difference between a child verbally telling you, I like this, I don't like this, and the amount of time you actually observe them, either physically observe them or digitally observe them um, working with it, which gives higher weight and how do you determine that? That's the first question. The second is, and, and if these are too many, you can skip them, but what's the difference between a digital project and a physical project and how you approach it? Those are great questions. Thank you. Um, so the first one is sort of, um, you know, time versus uh, uh, what they say. And so I would say it depends on the age of the child. And so the younger the child is, so if they're, you know, maybe hmm, seven or under, so like maybe first grade, uh, what they do is a lot more important than what they say, because we, we know that children have this uh, positivity bias, especially if they're dealing with a moderator that they haven't met before. So they just want to make Aunt Mary happy, um, you know, and, and so they think that means that, uh, you know, I should like what, what we're playing with and what she has given to me. Um, so, you know, so that's something really important. And that's why it's important to have a number of interviews. Uh, you know, and these, these uh, online interviews have been really interesting because I think we see kids kind of being really honest in a way that in a group setting, they maybe wouldn't, um, you know, cause they're, you know, they, they don't feel afraid to say, I, I don't like it. If, other kids are liking it, you know, so there's no opinion leadership. So that's that. Um, and then you talked about analog versus digital. Um, I think you mean the, the stimulus? Physical versus, versus digital. So a physical toy versus an online experience or an Alexa experience, that's what I meant. Oh, okay. Well, those are, uh, hmm. That's a, that's a really great question that, you know, it, it really depends on the project and what the objectives are. So if it's, you know, a property that they know, then that goes a long way um, from bridging the, the two-dimensional to the three-dimensional to, so what, you know, what we've been talking to our clients about for the last 10 years, really, is there's this kind of merging of the, there's the tangible toy, there's the thing I have, 
And there's the online toy, the thing that I talk about and other people talk about. And there's the social element as well. And so here's the thing I make and here's how other people respond to it. And all of those can be, you know, it's your Minecraft thing. Um, so that's, you know, 2G, but they're two dimensional, but spread to a lot of other people. And then there's slime. So that's three dimensional and I can actually send it to people for their reviews. Um, so that that's, you know, it's really complex, but I think that there are some questions in terms of, you know, how emotionally does it reach them? You know, does it give them pleasure? Does it make them feel a sense of personal acceptance? Um, does it make them feel like they're growing skills or building their identity in some way? Like those, those kind of cornerstones of the emotional drivers of appeal are what we come back to when things feel so disparate like that. Thanks for the question, Leslie. There's a couple more that have popped up that I think are really important to get to. Um, I know we're nearly at time, so I'm going to combine these two. But um, the question was from from uh, David and from Maria, and one is about accessibility and children with disabilities, and the other is about language barriers, which I'm going to put in the same bucket, even though they're very different. Um, but I'm wondering if when you're you're trying to make your playtesting more accessible accessible for those different types of populations, how you how you manage that um, and how how it differs from having a, a more uh, regular <laughs> play test? Well, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, not really one that I've had to deal with in the past year. So I'm going to just offer some hypotheses because I am not an expert at this. Um, in terms of the children with disabilities, I feel like virtual testing might actually be a lot better for them. So, you know, they don't have to have a caregiver that has to, you know, bring them to the groups. Um, you know, if we send them something, they can just play with it in the, in the way that they would in their natural environment. So I feel like that's, that's almost better. Um, you know, we, we think about children with things like ADHD or speech developments traditionally in terms of, traditionally the way that we have hoped that these kids would be set up for success. So, uh, you know, the way I run youth beat is I, I say that every study that we do should be a celebration of childhood and every child that comes out of an interview should feel like they had a good experience, even if they told me they hate whatever I showed them. So the, the, the way that we deal with that kind of thing is that we like to set up a child that if you're if you're not going to be successful in an in-person environment, then we would welcome you into an online environment. So it's it's really kind of a matter of communicating with the parents and understanding what is going to make this child feel good about this experience, and then you know whatever they feel about the the product they're testing, but to set them up. Uh, for success to be able to express themselves to us. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think it's really important. And, and, and it, again, it, it brings us back to this idea that the pandemic has, you know, put limits in place, but it's also introduced new opportunities um, for, for people who were not being reached before. So I think that's a really great way to sort of end the discussion. Um, I want to know if anyone else wanted to come on and either share an experience they had related to this topic, because I think it's a really important one. Um, I know we didn't really get into the translation um, question about localization and how you might be able to talk to other people. But um, if anyone else had had a few words to share, I think we're, we're pretty much at time, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it open because it's an important topic. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. And Mary, this was so informative. I loved the videos. I loved hearing just how much, it was obvious that you have so many years of experience doing this because you distilled it down into really actionable takeaways that helped 
um, you know, anyone who's new to this and also I'm sure seasoned veter veterans approach play testing differently and learn something new. So I really appreciate all the time you took to put this presentation together and to share that wisdom. Thank you. Thank you for coordinating. Thanks Absolutely. everybody for coming. I'll also just uh, mention in parting words that, um, oh, Mary, are you okay with sharing some of your slides? I know sometimes it's sensitive with having- Oh yeah, yeah. No, no, okay. no, but no, we made these just for you. These are okay. all publicly available. Go for it. <laughs> okay, that's great. <laughs> Um, every time we leave one of these uh, in the in the theme of accessibility, we know sometimes people can't make it. So um, about a week later, after we've put the pulled the video together and made edits, um, we post it to our YouTube channel. You mentioned Prevo. We had actually Denise speak on our last event, so um, that one is already live there, as well as all of the ones that we started doing since the pandemic. So please tune in and catch up on some older topics there. Um, look for this one if you want to revisit anything, and we'll also post a link to those slides um, so that you can access them there. Join our LinkedIn, um, follow us there. We always market all of these events and uh, welcome additional discussion there. So again, thank you for coming. Thanks to Creativity for, for being the host and sponsor of this series and uh, speak to you all soon. Take care.